Welcome to the Clinical Education Initiative podcast, Conversations with CEI, where we feature conversations with clinical experts, their experience and insights on current health issues in the areas of HIV, primary care and prevention, sexual health, hepatitis C, and drug user health. Hello, I am Tony Urbina, the medical director for CEI's HIV Primary Care and Prevention Center of Excellence. I am a provider and professor of medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, who has been working in the field of HIV for over 20 years. As of February 2022, the CDC notes that in the general population, individuals who are at highest risk of severe COVID-19 include those older than 60 years, those who are pregnant, solid organ or hematologic transplant recipients, and those with comorbidities, such as obesity, diabetes mellitus, and cardiovascular disease. Many people with HIV have one or more comorbidities that may put them at increased risk for a more severe course of COVID-19. In saying this, both COVID-19 and HIV disproportionately affect communities of color. To understand these health disparities, we must look at clinical data as well as the ingrained cultural and structural barriers to healthcare. On today's episode, I was able to speak with two experts to review the latest updates on HIV and COVID-19 and further discuss the pandemic's impact on those living with HIV. First, I spoke with Dr. Robert Fullylove, Associate Dean for Community and Minority Affairs and Professor of Clinical Sociomedical Sciences at the Columbia Mailman School of Public Health. In my conversation with Dr. Foleylove, he discussed many of the historical and structural factors that have contributed to racial inequities and health outcomes during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next, I spoke with Dr. Keith Siegel, Associate Professor in the Divisions of General Internal Medicine and Infectious Diseases at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. In my conversation with Dr. Siegel, he shared the latest data on COVID-19 risk burden of comorbidity, and clinical outcomes for persons living with HIV. Together, these discussions are all-encompassing of the qualitative and quantitative aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic and persons living with HIV. I hope you will find these conversations as fruitful and informative as I have. For our first segment, we are joined by Dr. Robert Fullylove. Dr. Fullylove is the Associate Dean for Community and Minority Affairs, Professor of Clinical Sociomedical Sciences, and the co-director of the city's research group. Since 1996, he has served on five Institute of Medicine study committees that have produced reports on a variety of topics, including substance abuse and addiction, HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, and damp indoor spaces and health. Since 2010, he has been teaching public health courses in six New York State prisons that are part of the Bard College Prison Initiative and also serves as the senior advisor to their public health program. Welcome, Dr. Fully Love, and thank you for joining me today. Pleasure was mine. Thank you for having me. That is quite an impressive intro that you have there. And I just kind of wanted to start with just kind of given your background in public health, all these years of experience, both within academia and the governmental sphere, can you tell me just a little bit more about what makes the topic of COVID-19 and HIV important to your work? Well, well, there are a variety of reasons that I might cite, but Mm -hmm. interestingly enough, perhaps the most important are those that have to do with my family. I'm the son and grandson of physicians. In fact, I'm named after them. Robert Fuller Love Sr. graduated from Meharry Medical College in 1907 and treated Spanish flu, the pandemic of 1918, in the Mississippi Delta. This wasn't just his taking care of a few sick patients. Spanish flu killed my grandmother, my father, my uncle, and my aunt were all infected by it. And I want to believe that the fact that my dad became a physician had a great deal to do with 
His experiences alongside a black physician in Mississippi at the turn of the century, where the type of public assistance that was available for folk who were struggling with this virus simply did not exist. The fact that my dad was board certified in urology and became a specialist in sexually transmitted diseases meant that in 1986, when I started doing work with Mindy Thompson Fullalove, one of the leading African American social psychiatrists in the United States, I had already come from a family that had a vested interest in the kinds of things that HIV represented. Number one, a viral illness that was, at the moment that we were dealing with it in 1986, largely thought to be transmitted through either drug use or through sexual behavior. The fact that we're now at COVID-19 means that this is for the full of family at some levels. The third viral pandemic that family members have had to deal with. And because as members of an African-American community that have throughout history really struggled with issues of health, health care, and access to health care. Uh, for me, at least, this is not just an interesting part of the science that I do, an interesting part of what I teach in the classroom. It also does, as I suggested, go really back to family history. That is very interesting, the background of your family, the legacy there, and that historical reference of the Spanish flu with COVID-19. So that's a really interesting historical perspective. Talking about the burden of uh, HIV and COVID-19 in the U.S., we know that people of color have borne some of the largest burden for both HIV and COVID-19 here in the U.S., um, particularly here in New York, I think, as well, New York City. What social and historical factors do you feel have created these disparities? More than anything else, and here I'm hearkening to the work of Mindy Falulo, what we're looking at might easily be described as the legacy of segregation in the United States. Why is that important? Because where you live has a great deal to do with the sorts of exposures you're going to have that might result in your contracting any one of a variety of health conditions or diseases. Segregation, which essentially put poor people of color in communities that were isolated from mainstream America, meant that access to health care, as well as access to the conditions, the social conditions that create health in the United States, simply were not present in sufficient quantities to assure that members of these populations were doing well. I constantly point to the degree to which COVID-19 wasn't just a problem for the individuals who were sick, because in many respects, the exposures that made this infection likely had everything to do with where they lived, where they worked, and how much of where they lived and where they worked wasn't the result of a set of historical conditions that have always set communities of color, especially poor communities of color, apart from the living conditions that mainstream Americans typically enjoy. So if you worked in a place that exposed you to the virus, if you lived in an overcrowded household, where social distancing was not possible. The right. legacy of segregation that produced that kind of housing in your neighborhood had a great deal to do with what I think we're confronting now. And I think the most important object lesson here, especially for folk who straddle the divide between medicine on the one hand and public health on the other, is that we don't want to locate the problems of illness solely in the individual who's sick or who's been exposed. If what we're trying to do in a medical slash public health environment is work to create the conditions that will protect people, then we have to look at environmental conditions with the same intensity that we examine issues like healthcare behavior and health risk behaviors. I'm really clear that historically, a society that emerged from 250 years of slavery to create a segregated America also set the stage for the devastation that we've seen with HIV, and much more importantly, with what we've been seeing lately with COVID-19. Robert, that's a very interesting point that you bring up. And correct me if I'm wrong, but is that term, is that redlining? Is that exactly what you're referring to? I am indeed. The Homeowners Loan Corporation in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. Here's how it worked out. People don't recognize, the further away we get from it, how devastating the Depression was in the United States. At its height in 1933, 25% of the American workforce was out of a job, was out of work. One out of every four workers was struggling to do what was necessary to meet the needs of family and neighbors at that particularly problematic period. 
The government was very clear that part of what it had to do was to get the economy back in motion again by seeing where it could invest money from bankers, private investors, as well as the federal government to assure that cities in the United States would once again be engines of economic prosperity. But the question about where to invest was quite pressing. And what people wanted to know was, let's make sure that we deal with areas that are already well off and avoid those areas that are probably going to result in a poor investment that will have no return and that might create social difficulties that the United States simply in the midst of a depression can't avoid. So what did they do? The Homeowners Loan Corporation basically did an audit of all of the major metropolitan areas in the United States and color-coded maps of the areas that they investigated to determine, amongst other things, where did you have places that were worthy of investment and where were places that you wanted to avoid? Where did they want to avoid investment? In neighborhoods that had high concentrations of African-Americans, high concentrations of undesirable immigrants, And even in places where Blacks live nearby, the government was very clear it didn't want to create neighborhoods with inhospitable social conditions. So it was very clear, let's stay away from the areas that white people might avoid, because that's who we think is going to drive the economy. And let's look at those places where investment is likely to bring us not just a return, but help the nation's economy get back on its feet. The legacy of redlining lives with us today. Many of the highly segregated communities that we identify every 10 years in the U.S. Census are in all too many instances the redlined areas of the 1930s. So that the legacy of that form of government sponsor, of at least I think it's fair to say government supported segregation, live with us today and live with us in terms of the healthcare conditions that are often present in these communities and that are often an absolute burden on the folk who live there, as well as on the taxpayer, who often has to pay for the elevated health costs that are associated with living in an area that is highly, highly toxic and where the people who are ill can't afford all of the conditions that are going to make health care possible. Right. And I think that I was reading, too, that they're now this redlining also increases exposure to pollution and those health impacts and um, effects. So really a lot of negative consequences due to this act and, and this kind of structural racism. I know you've done a lot of work with prisons and mass incarceration. Can like you talk a little bit about your thoughts about mass incarceration, rates of COVID-19 infection, and just what are the connections here? Well, let's begin with the connection to Redline. I've described it as a way of understanding the nature of racial and ethnic segregation in the United States. But it's also a way of demarcating problems in the American city that will occur in neighborhoods that are absolutely swamped by and buried in poverty. What do we know about poverty in the United States and what happens in the neighborhoods that are characterized by this level of impoverishment? They will be the neighborhoods that have the highest rates of crime. Modern policing basically said, let's go to deploy police in the areas where they're most needed. And where are those areas that are most needed? They're typically poor communities where people are helping themselves to sort of survive by engaging in the kinds of crimes that get for them things that they can't get with their jobs or with whatever source of income they have. Hotspot policing means that you've got a concentrated force that has as one of its responsibilities, not just guarding the peace of the public, but also making sure that the folk who violate that peace are arrested and incarcerated. So modern day policing makes it very likely that with a heavy concentration of folk in poor neighborhoods, the people who wind up being arrested, doing time in a jail or a prison, are also going to be the residents of those neighborhoods, which is why in, for example, the state of New York, where I'm speaking to you now, in the 1990s, 75% of the state prison population came from seven neighborhoods in New York City. And that prison population statewide was roughly 86% Black and Hispanic. So what am I describing? I'm describing a situation in which penal institutions, carceral institutions that are very far removed from the neighborhood are in fact neighborhood institutions nonetheless, because who's on the inside? 
folk who were from the neighborhoods that had been most characterized by problems created by poverty, segregation, and structural racism. So at some levels, the link is entirely there. Now, what this is going to produce is a population that is not part of the mainstream. Roughly 60% of all the people doing time in state and federal penitentiaries in the United States are people of color, Blacks and Hispanics. This is not a population that the average American cares about. We are not a nation that is very much about what do we do to help people who've been arrested and incarcerated come back to normal life. No, instead, we are very much down on crime. Imagine where in the United States a politician can get elected on a plank that says, I'm soft on you. And as a consequence, what you're going to see in these facilities is a population that is largely forgotten. Prisons were intended at some levels to make sure that the problems of the city would be out of sight and out of mind. And in that level of concentration, and with that level of indifference to what happens to people while they're there, why are we surprised that COVID-19 was so problematic? Number one, folk in those facilities are not housed in individual cells where social distance is likely to be possible. In states that have a zero tolerance policy for crime, you're gonna see most state prisons overcrowded. They have more people than they have space for, which means that they're living in dormitory settings where social distancing is impossible. And as a consequence, if you look, as was the case at the end of 2020, at the congregate settings that had the highest concentration of COVID-19 infection, of the 50 with the highest concentration, 45 were jails or prisons in the United States, suggesting that those were the conditions that not only made it right for COVID-19 to be circulated, this was also a population that in many states was the last to get vaccinated the group that was least likely to be tested, largely because everybody thought, well, that's not really my problem. How unfortunate as a consequence that what you had instead was a lot of circulation in and out of these facilities, especially jails, visitors, corrections officers, folks who do business, who supply the prisons or folks who went back and forth. And in too many instances, these centers that had such a high concentration of infection provided the necessary exposures that would make sure that what was present in the, in the prison would also be in the general community. Reinhard and Chen wrote a really important series of articles in a number of public health and medical journals in which they pointed out that a substantial portion of the circulation of COVID-19 in poor communities of color could be traced to what happened as a result of incarceration in a jail or a prison. So all of a sudden, all these things start to come together a history of segregation that made it likely that COVID-19 would be heavily found, heavily concentrated in poor communities of color, represents the same set of conditions that meant that COVID-19 would be particularly popular, would be particularly present in the populations that are present in our prisons, which themselves are typically folk who come from these communities. It is one vicious circle, and it is one that I think as a nation we're going to struggle to resolve over the course of the next couple of years. Wow. So you've hit on some really major topics here. What's your sense of where, as a nation, as a community, we're moving? And what do you think that we need to do really to better address these disparities? Well, I'm very clear that, number one, I live in one of those communities. For folk who are in New York, I'm at 169th between Broadway and Fort Washington, which means I'm smack dab in the middle of Washington Heights, a largely Dominican community that 50 years ago, interestingly enough, was considered to be part of Northern Harlem. So Harlem, whose formal boundary is about 12 blocks away, is another neighborhood that has struggled with many of the issues that I've described. And I find myself in a setting where I'm very clear about why, in the midst of this pandemic, we struggle to get people to understand that there was a problem, that part of what they could do to mitigate this problem was to get themselves tested and to get themselves vaccinated. And what I often found was a great deal of resistance to all of these things, literally because of the history that I've just described. People would stop me in the community and say, dog, talk to me. Every time I've tried to get the government to do something about my housing, I got nothing. Every time I tried to do something that would improve the quality of education, my kids were getting in these local schools, I got nothing. 
every time I tried to do something about some of the problems that I'm dealing with, with all these homeless folk in the community, I got nothing. Then all of a sudden, this virus shows up and the government can't wait to come to my neighborhood to stick a needle in my arm. If they wouldn't do anything about my problems, if they didn't care about me in the past, why should I trust that all of a sudden when they come bearing gifts, should I trust that their intentions towards me and my community are really good ones? In other words, what I'm describing is a situation where we're not just talking about the structural issues that expose folks to illness. We're also talking about how much public health, amongst other things, depends more than anything else on the belief that people will have that what we're doing is in their best interest. When they have a long history that seems to indicate that, at the very least, government cares very little about them or holds them in contempt. Once we show up as government saying, we've got something for you, something that will help keep you well, in a midst of a period where people are very doubtful about the intentions of government, what we have discovered in the two years we've been struggling with this pandemic, that is that the most important thing we can do to make sure that the work of public health is done in these areas is not to convince them that our science is sound. No, it's been to convince people that we can be trusted, that despite past history, we have their best interest at heart. I want to suggest this is one of the reasons why I've done so much to try and train people in prisons to do work in public health, because not only do we need them as people who can bridge the gap between the communities that they represent and the mainstream communities that are part of medicine and public health, they're the credible messages. And if the issues I've described literally come down to whom can I trust and whom can I believe, then I think our work to create more credible messengers who have the science of public health and the trust of the communities where they work. I think that's the direction that we've got to take as a nation. And I'm hoping that all the work that has been done in places like the Bard Prison Initiative will serve as a kind of a beacon for exactly how that can be done. Yeah, no, I think trust is really essential. I want to ask you just one thing. In terms of your experience in in communities living with HIV, lessons learned there and how they can, you think, help us or how they've helped or hurt with the COVID pandemic. Any thoughts there? Sure. Let me, let me just describe the one that, again, allows me to look at my work with HIV in the past and what I'm doing now, working in prisons at this point in the present. New York State prisons, at least 28 of them, have something called PACE, Prisoners Concerned About AIDS, Counseling, and Education. This is a program that has been partially supported by the New York State Department of Health and has done a great deal to carry the message that health educators know we've got to carry to populations on the inside, which are often at risk for exposure to HIV. Uh, Although it's hard to get people to admit this, part of what we know is that sex occurs behind bars, as does drug use. So having a peer-led organization that does the job of communicating important health information and trying its best to keep people healthy tended to be in many of the facilities where I work, the most important credible messenger when we started to talk about getting tested for COVID-19 and getting vaccinated. I want to suggest that that's the real object lesson that, that one learns from doing this kind of work in a local state prison, but which has potential implications for what we want to do nationally. Not only, uh, I dealing with a core of highly intelligent, very articulate individuals. They are, in fact, the credible messengers that we in public health are probably going to have to recruit in great numbers to mm-hmm. overcome some of the inertia, some of the barriers that have been created by our struggles with COVID-19. So, yes, I see that having had a public health challenge like HIV in prison, created a network of peer educators that had a great deal to do with lessening the risk of many folks on the inside from exposure to this virus, but it has also provided us with a platform where at least in this state, lots of people who can be informed and can inform their colleagues about COVID-19 can do so in a way that's effective and produces the kind of outcomes that we're desiring. People getting tested and people getting vaccinated. I really wanna see that as kind of an object lesson that certainly comes about from all the years I've been I've been spending doing this kind of stuff on the inside. Right, right. It's actually great to hear that, that those lessons learned 
could translate into better out, outreach and support. Robert, thank you so much. This has been a great, interesting conversation, lots of insight. Where can people learn more about your work and for this topic? <laughs> Isn't it great that we're living in the age of Google? <laughs> Let's be clear. If you can spell my last name, if you mm-hmm. Google it, everybody that shows up is going to be my dad, my granddad, my ex-wife, with whom I still work <laughs> very closely, Mindy Thompson Fullerlove, or me. So if you do Robert Fullerlove, I think the first thing that comes up is the webpage from Columbia University. And from there, I'm here. <laughs> well, that's excellent. Again, thank you so much for joining us and for your really you know, deep and thoughtful insights into this topic. Oh, thank you for the opportunity to share all this. My, I'm very appreciative. Thank you. Now that we spoke with Robert Fully Love about the social and historical context behind COVID-19, specifically in the persons living with HIV population, we would like to shift to discussing more of the data around COVID-19 and what this means for providers caring for patients living with HIV. For our second segment, we are joined by Dr. Keith Siegel. Dr. Siegel is an associate professor in the divisions of general internal medicine and infectious diseases at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Dr. Siegel received his bachelor's of science, master's of public health, and medical degrees from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and his PhD in internal medicine and infectious diseases training from the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Dr. Siegel is a researcher and epidemiologist with a primary research interest in clinical factors related to the abnormal biology of lung cancer and anal cancer in patients with HIV. He co-directs the Cancer Corps of the Veterans Aging Cohort and is the principal investigator of two NIH-funded studies to evaluate lung cancer screening and lung cancer treatment in people living with HIV. Welcome, Dr. Keith Siegel. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much, Tony. It's great to be here to talk about this topic. Yeah. As I mentioned earlier, you, you are an internal medicine and infectious disease specialist working during the pandemic, I think both um, both you and I were repurposed to the inpatient wards at Mount Sinai starting in, I think, the spring, right? Spring of 2020. Yep. In addition, you know, we had to manage patients in the outpatient settings. So just want to ask, what what were your first impressions about the role that HIV would play in the spectrum of COVID-19 diseases? And what makes this topic of COVID-19 and HIV so important to you? Thanks, Tony, for that question. I, you know, I actually feel like I remember running to you, into you uh, in the elevator at one point in spring 2020, probably both of us were covered in uh, uh, protective gear. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and reflecting a little bit on what we were seeing in terms of our patients, um, you know, we're HIV primary care providers, I remember at the very outset being very scared for everyone, but particularly being scared for our patients because we really didn't have any any good indication as to how people with some degree of immune disturbance might fare with COVID. And I remember running into you early on and both of us remarking that we were not seeing or hearing a lot of serious morbidity in, in our patients, that the wards were, it didn't feel like patients living with HIV were overrepresented in, in, among the patients that we were seeing in the hospital at that time. And along the, around that time, I, I was also hearing impressions from colleagues across the country who really were, I feel like, giving us consistent information that, that patients living with HIV were being admitted to the hospital, but it was not in excess of anything that, that they would have expected. And as a researcher, as an epidemiologist at that time, we got hit so hard in New York and, and had the ability to really investigate the, the data that, that was being collected through the electronic medical record. I wanted to look early on and just see if our experiences in those first couple of months were consistent with our impression that outcomes really weren't a lot worse. And so we did one of the earlier studies looking at outcomes for patients living with HIV in the early phase of COVID-19. And we focused on 
patients that had been hospitalized in the Mount Sinai system. Now, up to that point, we were hearing reports from around the world, China, Italy, which had get, gotten hit kind of hard, of case series of patients living with HIV that, that had been diagnosed with COVID. And mortality numbers in general didn't seem to be any higher than, than what we might expect. But up to that point, we didn't have good comparison data. And so what we were able to do with the Mount Sinai clinical cohort was look at outcomes for hospitalized patients with HIV and compare them to people with similar demographics that were admitted with, with COVID around the same time and compare outcomes. And that study, it confirmed what our impression that we were not seeing substantially worse, worse outcomes among people living with HIV and COVID. Yeah. And then I think as like our um, experience kind of grew, and I think those observations that we noted that there wasn't really a disproportionate impact in our patients, but I guess our patients were talking and I think that they were hearing that, wow, our, does being on antiretroviral therapy have some protective effect? And does the fact that immune activation may play a role and maybe provide a protective effect as well? So I'm just wondering your, your thoughts now that we have more data just about the role of antiretroviral therapy and just this immune dysregulation and how does it interact with, with COVID? Yeah. So I think that those are great questions that not only have other scientists and HIV clinicians been asking, but patients, like you mentioned, patients have really been interested in this as well, because we're at the phase now where our patients have lived through the pandemic. Many of them have gotten COVID. Many of them were very anxious about it and did not have severe COVID or saw friends or peers that had COVID or managed not to get COVID. In the community of, of both scientists and patients, this question of, of what's going on really has, has come about. And the antiretroviral issue has been, I think, a really interesting one. Early in the pandemic, there was some uncontrolled data, I think, out of China suggesting that lopinavir, ritonavir was potentially having a beneficial effect for patients with COVID. And I think people were using it off-label in China and, and some other places early on. And there was actually an RCT that was conducted, and it did not find really any signal of effect with lopinavir ritonavir. At the same time, tenofovir has also been an agent of interest. There is in vitro activity for tenofovir against SARS-CoV-2, and there has been observational data out of Spain suggesting that patients that were taking tenofovir had lower rates of severe outcomes from COVID. And interestingly, in our Mount Sinai cohort, we also saw something consistent with that, that patients that were not taking NRTIs were having worse outcomes. So patients taking NRTIs were actually having better outcomes. I believe there has been an RCT of tenofovir that has not, that, that there have not, we have not seen any results for that so far. So I think that there's going to be more information on that in the coming months. But I think that many of us have had a suspicion that there could potentially have been some, something protective going on, whether it was ART or whether it was some other factor. One other thing that I want to mention is the evolution of outcomes data for people with HIV over the course of the pandemic. Early on, we had a lot of smaller hospitalized cohorts where it seemed like outcomes were not worse for people with HIV. But then as we've gotten some of these bigger, more population-based studies or multi-cohort studies, there has been a suggestion that, there, that it does seem like there is a small increase in death and severe outcomes related to COVID in people living with HIV. Now, that leads to the question of what's driving that. Many of us that have dug into that literature suspect that it's potentially an increased burden of comorbidities in that subpopulations of people living with HIV that might be driving some of those worst outcomes. So still some confusion there, but yeah, the, the antiretroviral therapy issue, I think is a really, really interesting question. And again, and I don't know if you, what your feelings are on this, Tony, but throughout the pandemic over and over again, everything I've seen has been consistent with this idea that it has not been as serious as I thought it was going to be for our patients living with di differing degrees of immunodeficiency. I mean, what do you think? Yeah. I am would agree with you. I think when I was inpatient and up on the COVID floors, the ones that I really saw 
intubated or really in respiratory failure had, I mean, just a lot of comorbidities. So I think the ones that came to mind were transplant patients, but also just, you know, obesity, elevated BMIs, and then also diabetes. So yeah, I think I um, had a similar experience as that was a big driver. I mean, not, not like low CD4 counts or like untreated HIV, but just more the presence of these comorbidities that was really driving the bad outcomes. Yeah. I mean, I, and again, not to get too anecdotal, but you know, I, I have had patients with that have significant adherence problems with antiretrovirals that have AIDS that have very low CD4 counts that have had COVID and have been fine. <laughs> and again, this has not been deeply studied to my knowledge, but immunodeficiency, when you come contrast it with the transplant plant population, where I feel like we have consistently seen that patients taking anti-rejection medication do seem to do worse with COVID. Patients with significant immunodeficiency related to HIV, there has been less prominence of bad outcomes. Something seems to be going on. <laughs> so Keith, kind of shifting gears a little bit, there's been some New York State data on persons living with HIV being lost to HIV care, especially during the pandemic. And I know you, you're, um, this is something near and dear to you, but can you talk a little bit more about this data and what you feel has happened, what on we can do to reverse this? That is a great question. And we're in, we're in the phase now where I feel like a lot of us are looking back on the pandemic to try to identify what we did well with HIV care during that period and what needs to be improved because we don't know what's going to happen in the future, you know, and we could have future waves. There could be future mitigation efforts and we need to learn from the things we did well and and fix the things we did wrong. So we've looked back at the at the Mount Sinai system during the, we looked at the 12 months prior to COVID and then the first 12 months of COVID to see how often were patients having any kind of uh, HIV care visits, be that telehealth or non-telehealth, how often were they getting their viral loads checked, how often were they undetectable, how often were they getting antiretrovirals prescribed, and consistent with many other large health systems that are starting to report, there was some loss. We found that more than 10% of patients who had had a viral load checked in the year prior to COVID did not have any viral load check during the COVID year. And additionally, there was more than 10% drop in primary care visits, even when including telehealth. We have discussed these findings with the New York AIDS Institute, who has con confirmed that this phenomenon does appear to be real. So it does seem that patients were probably, there was some degree of disengagement with care. And unfortunately, when we've looked to see which patients were at the highest risk, so patients losing viral suppression, patients who we didn't have any sort of a check for an entire year, it does seem that, that African-American patients were more likely to be lost during that period and younger patients as well. So we know that there are some, some clear groups that probably, we could probably even get more granular about that, but there are groups that probably we would, we need to target if there's future activity like this, where accessing care might be more difficult. In terms of specific interventions to try to aid things, I'm not aware of any data at this time, but there's been more evaluation of how we're doing telehealth. And I mean, the one thing that I would just say, you, you may have some feelings about this too, Tony, is Telehealth was new to us when the pandemic broke out and we were not great at it. <laughs> and, and I would say we could still get better. And I, I don't think necessarily, it probably wasn't necessarily a provider issue, but like a, a much larger host of issues, including technical limitations, the technical limitations of our patients, our comfort with telehealth, how to use all the different screens that we need to access at one time, how to order tests that we might need in the future, things like that. So. In general, I think that there's an interesting emerging literature on the acceptance of our patients related to telehealth, but we need to continue to optimize, I think, telehealth should things like this ever happen in the future. Yeah, no, I agree. I think we're a lot, we're in a much better place than when we first started, worked out through some of those kinks, both provider and patient familiarity and ease with using this. But no, I think it's going to be important if a new wave does come that we kind of utilize this as a way to accessing our patients. So no, those are really, really important points. 
Shifting a little bit again here, just we know that persons living with HIV, they're a priority population in terms of getting the vaccines and the boosters. And can you talk about the kinds of immunologic response data and kind of reactions to the initial vaccinations and to boosters in persons living with HIV? Absolutely. Yeah. So this has been another area that I've been very interested in following. Vaccination, again, being one of the most important tools in our arsenal for trying to improve the situation with COVID both now and in the future. So I think one great piece of advocacy that happened early on with the the vaccine trials was the inclusion of people living with HIV in the big the big COVID vaccine trials. It's one thing that bothers me in general is when large clinical trials are done and people with HIV are excluded from them, which still happens in this day and age. Especially when you're dealing with something like a vaccine, you might a company might say, well, you know, we want to do our first trial in a uniform, generalizable group that doesn't have any form of immune deficiency, so that we have. They do it for a variety of sort of internal and validi- internal and external validity issues. But there was a lot of, I think, advocacy that went into the design and the implementation of those early trials. And people living with HIV were included in both the Pfizer and the Moderna trials, and were actually like an even larger component of some of the trials done in in South Africa for some of the other vaccines. So that was great. So we had data from the very beginning about the vaccines in people living with HIV. And what we've found consistently, and there's there's been more and more published data, uh, there have been several published studies now, and then a lot more data was presented at, at CROI, the big HIV conference, just a few weeks ago. And consistently, we see very, very strong immune responses to the vaccine in people living with HIV. So antibody responses, which is one of our, I'd say, most common measures of vaccine response, has been very, very high in people living with HIV. In one of the largest published studies, it was of all the immunosuppressed groups, people living with HIV actually had the best antibody response to the vaccine. So, and it was almost, you know, it was very close to the, the HIV uninfected comparators. So we're seeing excellent immune response to the vaccine. When we look at groups that are not responding as well, so not having as vigorous antibody antibody response. There have been a couple of studies now that have suggested that low CD4 counts are associated with a less robust response to the the vaccine. We also see lack of viral suppression has been associated. So those two situations do seem to be associated with a a lower response. But on the whole, vaccine response is very high and should be absolutely encouraged. There has been limited data on boosters for people living with HIV so far, but some data was presented at CROI recently, also suggesting that booster response is excellent in people living with HIV. So there is, and and in terms of harms of the vaccine, there was a really nice data shown at CROI on HIV viral suppression in the context of, of COVID vaccination. And it showed that HIV suppression was excellent after vaccination. So no immune modulation that might affect HIV control at all. So all signs are very positive. This is something that we should definitely be encouraging patients to do. Now, the the last thing I want to mention is, you know, just this issue of vaccine uptake. Vaccine uptake from the data that we have across the country, there have been a couple of uh, published studies now. As a whole, people living with HIV in the United States have accepted the vaccine at proportions very similar to the general population. So interpret that as you will. They are a population that probably wants really encouraged to get vaccinated. So we might want to see higher proportions, but there's certainly, at least nationally, it does not seem that there have been lower proportions. When New York City has looked at this, the proportion of people living with HIV was slightly lower. But again, the demographics of the HIV population in New York City are different than the general population. And when you start to account for some of these things, I think that the, the vaccine uptake becomes much more similar. So no increased harms, very subtle decreased efficacy and not anything I would say that's worth being concerned about. And we're seeing good uptake, but something that we need to continue to work on. That is fantastic. I know still in some patients, we have this kind of skepticism surrounding the vaccine. Do you have any examples of any patients that you found were skeptical? And then was there anything that you could say that maybe changed their mind or just helped them, you know, gain confidence in the vaccine? 
Yeah. So that is, that's the million dollar question. You know, uh-huh. vaccine hesitancy is, it is a massive problem in this country right now. And something that we, that we all are dealing with. I mean, the one thing I want to mention is when we look at vaccine hesitancy in people living with HIV, it does often seem to be very consistent with the, the rationale for not taking the vaccine often seems to be similar to people not living with HIV. So it, it's a lot of the same health beliefs that are contributing to people's vaccine hesitancy. From the data that we have, it does not seem to largely be any sort of HIV-related concerns that are preventing people from taking the vaccine. So the reason that I mention that is I think that we should use the tools that we're trying to use in the general population for improving vaccine uptake. I think that being frank and understanding with people and sometimes being willing to make it an ongoing conversation does help. I mean, one of the the things that I like to really reinforce are, and these may seem like very much common sense, but just the tremendous number of people that have been vaccinated and how incredibly safe all of our vaccine options are. So that over a billion people have received this vaccine. The safety is extremely well characterized at this point. And, and that these vaccines, a big issue right now is that there is a lot of talk about what the purpose of the vaccine is now, because the, with Omicron, the vaccine is less effective at preventing infection. But I think really just taking one second to point out that the vaccine is so important for preventing severe COVID, keeping you out of the hospital and keeping you alive. And, and I think you're not going to be able to change everybody's minds, but sometimes, sometimes patients just want to see you give that like couple minutes of extra commitment to it. And I don't know, it's not like it always works for me, but I do feel, feel like I've had a few minor victories in that regard. <laughs> Excellent. Is there anything else you want providers or public health professionals to know just based on your kind of research um, in this field? I think I would go back to the idea that one thing that I've been concerned about throughout all of this, it, and it may be less and less as time has gone on, but just to be conscious that some of our patients may feel like they are at higher risk of bad things happening to them related to COVID because of their HIV. And that's why I, and this has a lot of implications, and these are implications that we've been discussing all throughout COVID for a variety of populations, but isolation, not paying attention to other health conditions. You know, we've been talking a lot about comorbidities, neglecting diabetes care, neglecting exercise. I feel like there's going to be a huge obesity problem after all of this as well. And I think that understanding that HIV, there are some studies that show that there is a little bit higher risk for people living with HIV, but I would say on a whole, our patients really do not have excess risk. And that some people need to hear that message because I think that we need to also work on some of these isolation issues and the negative mental health impacts that all of this has had on people. So that's just the the one thing that I would add. Uh, other than some of the other themes that I've been discussing, you know, like we, I think it's really important that we're pushing vaccination. But yeah, so that that I would say is to me the most important message. Excellent. Yeah, those are very very good points and just uh, encouragement and also just reassuring for our patients living with HIV to really continue taking their antiretroviral therapy, keep their immune systems robust, but don't neglect you know other health issues that may be a bigger driver for bad outcomes. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining me today. This has been a very interesting and informative conversation. Of course, there's a lot more that we can unpack in one episode. But Keith, I just want to ask, where can people learn more about your work or this topic? Yeah. So I like to direct people actually to the CDC website because there is a section on COVID and and living with immunosuppressive illnesses, including HIV. So I I think there's some helpful advice there. In general, I, I, I do think that the CDC guidelines are a very useful tool. They have been well thought out. I like to give them a few extra points because making decisions in during COVID has been extremely difficult for everybody. Uh, we're working with quality of evidence that is sometimes good, sometimes bad, and, and ultimately people have to make decisions sometimes. So I'm a big fan of, of their guidance. In terms of specifics, to HIV, I still like to point people back to my initial paper, because which was published in, in uh, Clinical Infectious Diseases, 
because I do feel like it, it does give a bit of an overview about the clinical scenarios that we were seeing with, with patients living with HIV and COVID. There have been several review papers now written on HIV and COVID as well. And I would encourage you to take a look at those because those do provide a nice summary of a lot of the things that, that we've discussed today, but a lot of the sort of clinical issues that people might be interested in and in taking care of our patients. Thank you, Keith, so much for joining us today. Thank you for tuning in. Join us next time for a new episode of Conversations with CEI. Visit us at ceitraining.org and follow us on CEI social media platforms.